like to welcome you to this uh, <coughs> edition of the Guido Rising Report, and uh, today, <laughs> and for a few more videos hereafter, we're going to be discussing the fact of, could a resurrected Pope John Paul II be possible? Now, I'm not sure if any of you are aware of uh, a certain uh, ideology or debate regarding um, these few verses here in Revelation 17 through 13 regarding the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. Um, I'm sure you probably have heard about it, um, and so this is going to be the basis of this report. Um, I'm going to prevent you, you know, I'm going to provide for you a whole bunch of different types of evidence and you come up with your own conclusions now as far as a resurrected Pope John Paul II and what the Vatican you know has planned I don't know I don't know but it just seems really weird that they are you know just ecstatic over the last few months since basically October of 2012 over Pope John Paul II um, and uh, obviously he was the most revered individual in the Universal Church. Many still flock to him for his relics, like the vial of blood. And um, there's a report that came out a few months ago uh, that a woman just absolutely just wept over his blood just to be in uh, a presence of him. Um, so, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of strange things going on with this guy even though he's been dead since 2005. Now again, I'm not going to sit here and say this is absolutely 100% fact, all right? But what I will say is the technology for cloning and to manipulate um, bodily functions to bring them back to life has been studied has been done uh, even dating back to the 1940s so and I will provide evidence for that as well so, um, so I will go ahead and uh, state for the record as I, as I just said that um, you take this video and you just store it in the back of your mind and just think of the possible outcomes. Um, a little bit of background on Pope John Paul II. The, the majority of the world revered this man. I mean, he, he, he was very charismatic. Uh, a lot of people loved the man and still love the man um, to this day. He, even people that um, have done many exposés on the Universal Church revere Pope John Paul II because um, yeah, he was such a proponent for world peace and these types of things much like Pope Francis is doing right now now obviously um, um, there has been a little bit of a sidestep here regarding Pope Francis now Pope Francis has been uh, speculated as Petros Romanos and everything like that. However, um, in a future video uh, that's going to be connected with this little series is going to uh, tell you that there is actually more connection of Pope John Paul II possibly being this Petros Romanos than there is Pope Francis. Okay, you got to remember the thing is, is you know, personally, we're going to get into you know, personally, I think he may be a type of a stand-in, if you will. The reason being is because he is a Jesuit. He has not he, he has not forsaken his uh, oath as a Jesuit. And here he is, elected as Pope. A black Pope elected as Pope. Okay. And so, it seems like this, this individual, this Pope Francis, might be a stand-in for a possible future... Um, 
beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit. Is that going to be Pope John Paul II resurrected from the dead? Um, even though it won't be Pope John Paul II, obviously, but um, one can only wait and see. Now, I know this is going to be very strange, okay? So, I mean, and, and this is probably the strangest video I've ever done. I'm probably going to get a lot of weird comments and stuff like that, and I understand that, okay? But again, you can't take nothing away from what the powers that be are trying to do as far as establishing a one world system and uh, and the technologies of science and what they're capable of doing so this is why I'm stating this as a possibility and I'm gonna you know and I'm gonna give you scriptural proof for this possibility um, and the aspect of let's take a look at second Thessalonians 2 1 through 4 which says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Okay. Now, if you notice that these are separated by commas and these types of things, okay? You have a falling away that's supposed to come first. Now, to those that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, understand that this man of sin, this antichrist figure, is supposed to come before you're even whisked out of here. I don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, but understand that fact, <laughs> okay? Um... um it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now, you have to be blind to see that there's not a falling away of the church happening now. Okay. You, you can read about uh, the church of Laodicea like you're reading today's uh, newspaper in, in regards to Christianity. See how much it has fallen away. So, you can see the falling away taking place. And that man of sin be revealed. Now, that man can also be interpreted as man of sin, um, as or man of sin, as in the the uh, the uh, number of popes that have gone through time. Each pope is considered a man. And then, if you notice, there's another comma: the son of perdition. Okay, in Revelation 17, you talk about a beast that sends up out of the bottomless pit and goes into perdition, which means utter destruction. Um, so verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now bear in mind, this temple of God is the body of believers. It is not going to be a temple built in Jerusalem, okay? We are the temple of God, all right? This is not talking about a rebuilt temple of any sorts. Now, however, there could be a dual meaning of that, possibly. But this figure is going to be sitting among the universal body of Christ, declaring himself that he is God. And from all the history of the popes and everything like that, they have done that numerous times. Um... But, I mean, what would happen if you see a resurrected Pope John Paul II and, <laughs> and, as many as and as much as people revered him when he was alive, how much more so would they revere him in awe if uh, he was, quote, resurrected, sort of say, okay? Okay. <clears throat> Moving down to verse 6 through 12. Now, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So the mystery of iniquity is already working at the time of this writing. 
Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Now there's been uh, debates on whether that's uh, Michael the Archangel or the Holy Spirit, but I don't necessarily believe it's the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. He can be everywhere at one place at one time. I have a strong indication that I actually might be talking about Michael the Archangel because it talks about an angel standing up and uh, loosing the uh, four corners of the earth or whatever to stand up and uh, you know so but there's a, a lot of debate for discussion on that I'm not gonna get into that right now I personally think that that might be talking about possibly Michael the Archangel um, but you know that's for another topic for another time and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness and of, right, of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And when you got people going up and say, oh, I'm in tears because I just wanted to feel the presence of Pope John Paul II with just this vial of blood in a church, I would think that that would be cause for concern of verse 11 where it says for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness I, I mean that would be a pretty good strong delusion that God sends if they're all, all of a sudden is a resurrected Pope John Paul II <laughs> okay so here's this uh, picture here I'm sure probably you have seen this before um, the eight kings of Revelation the next and last Pope now obviously Pope Benedict resigned and you got Pope Francis right now okay could he be in between the seventh and eighth as a stand-in it is very possible and I'll get into that here in a moment but obviously um, the eight kings would have started according to this uh, interpretation back in 1922 with the election of Pope Pius XI the Lateran Treaty of 1929 the first king okay so now we're gonna get into uh, these verses here in Revelation we'll go back to this picture in a moment Revelation 17 7 which says and the angel said unto me wherefore didst thou marvel I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her which hath the seven heads and ten horns the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Okay. And here is a mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Okay, so it is so here in verse 9 we already see what the seven heads are these are seven mountains a lot of people will say that these are the seven hills of Rome a lot of people will say that these are the seven mountains of Israel I would like to say that this is probably representing the seven continents of the earth okay you know I mean as time draws near uh, the mysteries of God will be revealed to those that um, seek him with all their with all their heart soul and mind I firmly believe as knowledge of the Word of God will increase as we progress further in these end times but right now um, we all see through glass darkly I personally believe that these seven mountains are um, uh, represent the seven continents of the earth you gotta remember on which the woman said this mystery Babylon mother of harlots it is sitting on top of this of the whole world uh, causing the the kings to be kings and the nations to be drunk of the fornication of her wrath and these types of things which is religious uh, which is basically a religious soup 
of uh, apostasy and whoredoms, basically. So, now, I mean, because that's that definition, is, that, that definition right here is pretty clear. The seven heads are seven mountains. Okay. Now in verse 10, it gets a little more interesting. There are seven kings. Okay. So right now we have already seen that the seven heads are seven mountains. Okay. But there are seven kings. Five are fallen. And one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Okay, so obviously, we're talking about a king here. All right. So basically, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit is a specific king. You can read in verse seventeen, verse eight, and then you jump down to verse seventeen, eleven. You can tell what this beast is. Is this the beast with seven heads and ten horns? Mm, I don't think so. It, it's like a hybrid type thing of a, possibly of a separate beast. Okay. But the beast as a whole is this political, this really, this religio political system. But there is another beast, which is a king, that shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. It, it's very hard to, I mean, I'm, that's probably a little confusing, but that's basically how I'm reading it here. Because if you go down to verse 12, it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest. Are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with the beast sees power as kings one hour with the beast these are these ten kings that receive power as kings one hour with the beast and it sends up out of the bottomless pit these have one mind and should, shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now, this eighth king that is of the seven. We'll go back to this picture here. You know, a lot of people have attributed this to be the Caesars, the seven Caesars, or or whatever. Um, and. Uh, here we see the Pope Pius XI. This was when the Lateran Treaty was introduced, and we'll take you to that right now. The Lateran Treaty was also called the Lateran Pact of 1929, effective June 17, 1929 to June 3rd of 1985, between Italy and the Vatican. It was signed by Benito Mussolini for the Italian government and by Cardinal Secretary of State. Petro Gaspari for the papacy and confirmed by the Italian Constitution of 1948. Upon ratification of the Lateran Treaty, the papacy recognized the state of Italy. The papacy recognized the state of Italy with Rome as its capital. Italy, in return, recognized papal sovereignty sovereignty over the Vatican City a minute territory of 44 hectares or 109 acres and secured full independence for the Pope so the papacy the Vatican City has become nonetheless a independent state okay just like you have like Israel or the United States it's an independent state Vatican City is an independent state a number of additional measures were agreed upon. Article 1, for example, gave the city of Rome a special character as the center of the Catholic world <coughs> and place of pilgrimage. Article 20 stated that all bishops were to take an oath of loyalty to the state and had to be Italian subjects speaking the Italian language. By Article 34, the state recognized the validity of Catholic marriage and its subjection to the provisions of canon law. Uh... 
nullity cases were therefore reserved to the ecclesiastical courts and there could be no, no divorce. The state agreed by Article 36 of the Concordat to permit religious instruction in the public primary and secondary schools and conceded to the bishops the right to appoint or dismiss those who imparted such instruction and to approve the textbooks that they used. With the signing of the Concordat of 1985, Roman Catholicism was no longer the state religion of Italy. Okay, it's very interesting because now you got all of these things happening between the Vatican and Jerusalem, where the Pope has now got full access to the Last Supper room <coughs> within Jerusalem, and he had President Perez of Israel go to the Vatican to discuss possible unification of the three religions and regarding the building of another church or a temple if you will uh, that will have culmination of all three of the faiths together okay under a universal religious system under a universal law So, as of 1985, Roman Catholicism was no longer the state religion of Italy. This change in status brought about a number of alterations in Italian society. Perhaps the most significant of these was the end to compulsory religious education in public schools. The new concordant also affected such diverse areas as tax exemptions for religious institutions and ownership of the Jewish catacombs. So, here we have this, uh, this treaty which ended in 1985 in which Roman Catholicism was no longer the state religion of Italy. But now what do you have, and obviously the popes are backing this, is you have a culmination of bringing all the religions together. And Pope John Paul II was basically the first to to bring that about. In no matter what creed or faith they are from. <laughs> okay, so the treaty is still intact of of Vatican City still being an independent sovereign state, but it is not the but the uh, Catholicity or Roman Universalism is no longer the state religion of Italy. But the, 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 the treaty in itself is still intact of it being, of the Vatican City being recognized as an independent state with its own central bank and these types of things. Okay. So here we have, that was all under Pope Pius XI. So right here, the Vatican became an independent state. Okay, obviously... He's gone. Pius the Twelfth is gone. Pius or uh, John the Twenty Third is gone. Pope Paul the Sixth is gone. John Paul the First is gone. He resigned only thirty-three days as the fifth king. Okay. And now we have Pope John Paul the Second, which is the sixth king. Um, so you have five that have fallen, one is, and he reigned from 1978 to 2005 when he died. He was seriously wounded in 1981, um, and it was a miracle that he was basically remained alive, if you will. I'm pretty sure a lot of you who are old enough remember that. I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> um... And that was only three years into his papacy. So here we have this uh, um, rule. Uh, this one is right here, and he's gone. And his predecessor was Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. All right, and he started his reign in March of uh, April nineteenth of two thousand five, and resigned. Um. He resigned 
around February of this year. Okay, so rules only for a short time. And right here, if this is the case, if this uh, devil from the from the bottomless pit is impersonation of Pope John Paul II, then that will mean that this Pope Francis is a stand-in. Okay. What do I mean by stand-in? Well, the thing about Pope Francis, as I said, was he is a Jesuit. Okay. The Jesuit has different oaths and types of things that they have to abide by. Okay. Now, before I go into the oaths and stuff like that and what they have to say or whatever, I want to go over this article with you that was just released from the Telegraph on the 19th of June, 2013, and there has been more updates on this, and I do have those, um, which says, Vatican to announce John Paul the second miracle. The Vatican has secret, secretly attributed a mystery miracle to the late John Paul II, clearing the way for him to be declared a saint. The Holy See has yet to reveal what the miracle was or where and when it took place, but Vatican sources said it would amaze the world. It concerns the extraordinary healing of a Costa Rican woman who was cured of a severe brain injury after her family began praying to the memory of the late Polish Pope according to reports in the Italian media. Details of the miracle are likely to be announced at the end of this month or at the beginning of July, a Vatican insider told the Daily Telegraph. John Paul II was beautified, the first step towards sainthood, in a lavish outdoor ceremony in St. Peter's Square in May 2011. The second miracle, which is required in order for him to be given full statehood, reportedly occurred on the very day of this beautification. Okay. It has reportedly been recognized by theologians from the Vatican's Congregation of the Cause of Causes of Saints, which is in charge of examining the dossiers of candidates for sainthoods. It now has to be signed off by a commission of cardinals and bishops, which is expected to happen within the next few weeks. John Paul's first attributed miracle was the apparent healing of a French nun, Sister Marie Simone Pierre. Her recovery from Parkinson's disease after praying for the late Pope's intercession had no medical explanation the Catholic Church maintains. Now, understand that these miracles obviously happened in a sense of the Pope is already dead, okay, and he's a human being. He's not a god, okay, he's not a god-man, he's not a god on earth, okay, he's just a man, okay, so, so this is... These miracles are happening from a quote-unquote Pope John Paul that is not in the flesh. Okay, this is happening from some spiritual intercession between these people and Pope John Paul II. So bear that in mind. The Polish pontiff is likely to be formally made a saint in the autumn either on October 20th or November 24th. Okay. Now, here we have this article that is related to this one that just came out. Pope John Paul II's second miracle approved. The late John Paul II will be made a saint by the end of the year after a commission of Catholic cardinals approved the second miracle attributed to him. Now he was already he he was only beautified last year in twenty or two years ago in twenty eleven. From beautification until sainthood uh, in Catholic tradition usually takes five years. Any other saint to be declared a saint, it's five years. This guy is being declared a saint <laughs> only two years ahead of him being beautified. Okay. So bear that in mind. Two miracles are required for canonization. The first regarding a French nun whose recovery from Parkinson's disease cannot be explained by a Vatican panel of medical experts has already been attributed to the Polish pontiff. It paved the way for his beautification in 2011, six years after his death in 2005. 
The Vatican has yet to release details of the second miracle, but it is understood to concern the healing of a severely ill woman from Costa Rica on the very day that John Paul II was beautified. She and her family had prayed to the late Pope for his intercession. Not to Jesus Christ, not to God the Father, but to the Pope. Okay. The exact details of the miracle would amaze the world, according to Vatican insiders. So whatever this miracle is, it's supposed to be supposed to amaze the world. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll have to wait and see um, how amazing this miracle is. It still has to be signed off by Pope Francis, but that is regarded as a formality and is likely to happen in the next few days. Uh, Federico Lombardi, I ain't going to call him father. I ain't supposed to call him no man father, but your father in heaven, so I'm not going to call him father. Federico Lombardi, the Vatican spokesman, told the Daily Telegraph, John Paul is likely to be canonized along with another former pontiff, John XXIII, nicknamed the Good Pope, who initiated reforms to the Church under the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s. He was beatified in 2000. The two popes could be canonized on December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, an important feast day for the Church. Very interesting. Now, back to Pope Francis, and I'm going to close this video. And leave you guys for some food for thought here. Now, I, you're not going to be able to see this whole thing, but um, I'm going to read it, and I'll post the links to the, all these articles below. So that uh, you can go and search these out for yourselves. But. Obviously the Jesuits are a military religious order of the Roman Catholic Church or Universal Church. I like to use the word universal better. Because according to the, the age we are living in. The, this universal church is uh, not specifically the body of true believers. But is the uh, forefront of universalism of a universal wide religion so I like to use the universal church inside of the Catholic Church it means universal but digressing but anyways so I'm gonna go ahead with these quotes I'm not gonna read all of it but uh, I'm gonna um, really cut to the chase about how Pope Francis could possibly be a stand-in, okay? Now, when a Jesuit, quote, when a Jesuit of the minor rank is to be elevated to command, he is conducted into the chapel of the convent of the order, where there are only three other present, the principal or superior standing in front of the altar. On either side stands a monk, one of whom holds a banner of yellow and white, which are the papal colors, and the other a black banner with a dagger and red cross above a skull and crossbones with the word Inri and below them the words Eustom Necar Rius Impius the meaning of which is it is just to exterminate or annihilate impious or heretical kings governments or rulers upon the floor is a red cross at which the postulant or candidate kneels the superior hands him a small black crucifix which he takes in his left hand and presses to his heart and the superior at the same time presents to him a dagger which he grasps by the blade and holds the point against his heart the superior still holding it by the hill and thus addresses the postulant okay so this is a pretty interesting little oath here and I'm just gonna read the first paragraph here okay this is all I'm gonna read this is from uh, containing the Congressional Record House Bill 1523 Contested election case of Eugene C. Bonneville against Dulce S. Butler, February 15, 1913. Pages 3215 6. The oath appears in its entirety in the book The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln by Burke McCarty, pages 14 through 16. So, so the superior, I'm just going to read this first, first paragraph, and then you're going to understand why I believe that. <laughs> Um, 
that Pope Francis could just be a stand-in. And it's not necessarily this Petro Fermanus that everyone is claiming to be. My son, heretofore you have been taught to act the dissembler among Roman Catholics, which obviously Pope's Roman Catholic to be a Roman Catholic, and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, not even the Pope, to trust no man among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Huguenots to be a Huguenot, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among other Protestants generally to be a Protestant and obtaining their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits and to, denounce, and to denounce with all the vehemence in your nature your holy religion and the Pope and even to descend so low as to become a Jew among Jews that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. Now even though Pope Francis is officially elected Pope I want you to really pay attention to what I just said here in this first line among Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren to believe no man to trust no man so is he really elected Pope to be a stand-in just to be a spy possibly perhaps I mean, you have the Jesuit order in and of itself had that have expelled popes from office. And here we have the, quote, black pope, a, you know, the black pope of the black order sitting in the white, you know, the seat of the white pope. It's kind of odd that that is the case. So... Obviously, if this guy is just a stand-in in, in the aspect of awaiting the eighth king that ascends up out of the bottomless pit, which could possibly be a Pope John Paul II impersonator, because the real Pope's dead, folks. The real John Paul II is dead. Whatever type of resurrection they could be getting ready to fake, it's not going to be him. All right. So is this guy basically being used as a spy to basically get everybody ready for this big surprise that could be happening in the near future? And then basically Pope Francis giving the reins to a newly resurrected Pope John Paul II. Strange as it may sound, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction, folks, but the possibilities are there with DNA cloning and uh, manipulation of the brain of brain tissues to actually make it seem like things are coming back to life and it has been done before it's been done since the 1940s and you would think that even <laughs> 70 years have gone by you, I'm pretty sure that the technology is more advanced now than it was in 1940 and I'll show you the video clip of that Okay, so, plus I thought this was really interesting that on April 29th of 2011, when this was updated, body of late Pope John Paul II, it's funny how they use the phrase, he is risen, exhumed ahead of his beautification in the Vatican. And I'm not going to read the entire article, um, but I want to point Obviously, these are pictures of them raising the, the casket up. But I wanted to point this interesting fact. That his casket, his body, it will then be moved to a new crypt under an altar in a side chapel near Michelangelo's statue of the Pieta. The marble slab that covered his first burial place will be sent to Poland. Huge posters of John Paul, who died in 2005, hanging across Rome ahead of the ceremony, expected to be attended by a million pilgrims which will put him in the path to sainthood. As the Vatican prepares to move the late pontiff one step closer to sainthood this Sunday, Rome has been caught up with the beautification fever. Now, again, this was in 2011. But I want to really focus in on this point, that his body or his crypt, 
or his coffin is then is going to be is, is moved. It's already there now, to an altar in a side chapel near Michelangelo's statue of the Pieta. Now, who is Michelangelo? Many should know who Michelangelo is. Michelangelo is the famous art uh, painter, the famous artist. Okay, was an Italian sculptor, painter, architect, poet, and engineer of the High Renaissance who exerted an unparalleled influence. On the development of Western art, despite making few forced forays beyond the arts, his versatility in the disciplines he took up was such a high order that he is often considered a contender for the title of the archetypal Renaissance man, along with his fellow Italian Leonardo da Vinci. Now, Michelangelo, long story short, is the originators of the pictures of Jesus that you see today. The Jesus wearing the Immaculate Heart. Uh, the Jesus in the, in, in the paintings of the Last, Last Supper and these types of things. This was all Michelangelo's doing that brought this about. Okay, the, this, this fake Jesus that is not what Jesus looked like really started with Michelangelo and yet here for some reason or another Pope John Paul II's casket is being placed near Michelangelo's Pieta am I saying anything as fact or certain that they are definitely um, you know going to be resurrecting Pope John Paul? No, but uh, it's kind of interesting how these pieces are kind of being put together. Here's another. Um, in his lifetime, he was also called Il Divino, the Divine One. One of the qualities most admired by his con contemporaries was his from Bita, a sense of awe-inspiring grandeur, and it was the attempts of subsequent artists to imitate Michelangelo's impassioned and highly personal style that resulted in mannerism, the next major movement in Western art after the High Renaissance. Kind of interesting that this guy that uh, came up with the originators of the pictures of Jesus in the stained glass windows that you see now was revered and called in his lifetime the divine one and here you have Pope John Paul II casket or uh, whatever now being moved to uh, Michelangelo's Pieta <sighs> there's a lot of weird things going on with this with this deceased Pope that is just uh, mind-boggling okay and um, So, I mean, the question still remains, is is, is, is this going to be a impersonator, an imposter, um, that's going to impersonate a Pope John Paul II that uh, comes up out of the bottomless pit? It's yet to be certain, but given the whole aspect of the alien agenda, UFO agenda, and these types of things, you know... It, and plus all the deceptions going on and the fact that this guy was so much revered um, in his lifetime as basically a savior to the world how much would people really fall for this guy if he was resurrected from the dead obviously it wouldn't be him and be an impersonator but still I mean that's something you got to think about. I mean, what a grand illusion that would be. Why would that be such a grand illusion? Well, I'm going to show you right now. Just for this little simple example alone. This was updated Thursday, May 9th, 2013, so fairly recent. Okay, now listen to this. Blood of late John Paul II on display. Hundreds of people flocked to Corpus Christi Church on Buffalo's east side on Thursday, a, a reliquary holding the blood of the late Pope. John Paul II was on display until 8 p.m. Now, listen to this. Now, 
you gotta think about the whole aspect of it. If this guy is raised from the dead, people like this individual here are gonna be so caught up in a strong delusion. And do you think that others won't as well? I mean, this is just something you gotta think about. Lisa Coodmore and her mother Sharon visited the church on Thursday. Quote, it was surreal. It was really surreal. It was more. I came with my mother. She was literally shaking, Lisa said. I had to drive with her, pick her up from work to bring her here. This has been a lifelong dream. Lifelong dream. Just to see the Pope. Alive or dead. I don't think she'd be this excited if I was taking her to Vegas. Sharon added, as you can see, the tears are coming down my face. I'm just glad I got to be that close to a part of him. This is the kind of fervor that this man is still getting even after his death. How much more so if they fake a resurrection? I mean, this is just something to think about. The reliquary will be on display in Montreal on Friday. John Paul II could be canonized as early as this October. Canonized as a saint, basically. So I'm going to go ahead and close part one here. And um, part two, there might be a part three. It's going to get even more stranger. <laughs> it's going to get even more weird. So uh, just bear, bear with me on this. Um, as we uh, dive into this together. Uh, truth be told, truth be known, stay safe, God bless, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.